Welcome to Conservation and Management of Amphibians and Reptiles for U.S. National Parks in the Southeast. This is the final in a four-part series. Um, my name is Jen Williams. I'm the Federal Coordinator for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, we will provide two breaks during the presentations for questions, and the presenters will announce when those times are available. Um, and this, this ensures that you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to submit your questions. Um, but throughout the presentation, um, we have an availability for you to submit questions or to make comments. And so um, you can just type your message in your chat or questions box, and then we will work with our speakers to get you a response during the question breaks. And so we are recording today. Um, we're already in recording mode. Um, please email me at jen underscore williams at nps.gov to obtain a recording of the webinar. But we will also provide each of these webinars on the um, PARC website. Um, PARC recently started a YouTube, YouTube channel, and so we have the other three um, webinars that are part of this series already uploaded on those sites. So some background information about today's speakers. Um, Mark Bailey has an MS in zoology from Auburn University. He has been active in the conservation and management of southeastern wildlife with an emphasis on her pedofauna for over 30 years. He worked for the U.S. Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy before establishing his own consulting firm, um, which is known as Conservation Southeast. Mark is um, a past Alabama state rep to the Gopher Tortoise Council, and he currently serves on the board of the Alabama Wildlife Federation. And along with the other co-authors of, uh, of Park's Habitat Management Guidelines of the Southeastern United States, he is a recipient of the Florida Wildlife Society's mm -hmm. Paul Moeller Herpetological Conservation Award. And Mark also is a co-author of Turtles of Alabama. Then we also have Joe Mitchell, who has a PhD in ecology from the University of Tennessee. And Joe has focused on the conservation, ecology, and natural history of amphibians and reptiles for over 40 years. Joe is self-employed and has conducted conservation and management research on 16 national parks and also on um, 21 military bases, among other federal properties. Joe wrote the first habitat conservation plan under a joint venture by two federal agencies, um, and they were the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Joe is the author of The Reptiles of Virginia, which was published under Smithsonian Institution Press, and he's the senior editor of Urban, Urban Herpetology, which is um, done under the Society for the Study of Amphibians and Reptiles. And our third speaker is Kurt Buhlman. Kurt holds a BS in Environmental Studies from Stockton State College in New Jersey. He has an MS in Wildlife Sciences from Virginia Tech and a PhD in Ecology from the University of Georgia. Kurt has worked with the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Service, Conservation International, the Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as many other agencies. He is currently a senior research associate with the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Laboratory. And Kurt operates Buhlman Ecological Research and Consulting, LLC, as an environmental consultant. Kurt's research interests include life history and evolutionary ecology with application for species recovery, conservation, and management. And Kurt has studied terrestrial habitat needs of amphibians and reptiles around seasonal wetlands. Um, he's also investigated the effects of prescribed fire, control of invasive species, and wetland restoration. He has been involved with turtle habitat management restoration projects and has helped implement reintroduction strategies for gopher tortoises at several sites in the southeast and, more recently, head starting research with freshwater turtles, such as blandings and wood turtles, in the northeast as well as with desert tortoises in the Mojave Desert. So the fourth author of um, this habitat management guideline is Jeff Holmes, but Jeff is not going to be one of the presenters today. Um, he has a, a very frantic uh, field schedule, and so he's out in the field doing a bunch of fun things. So as I mentioned previously, the webinar series um, has four different components. We've already covered the Northwest, the Midwest, and the Northeast. <laughs> Um, the reason we did not cover the southwestern U.S. is because that habitat management guideline was just completed in August. Um, if you're interested in um, purchasing that um, park product, please email me again at jen underscore williams at nps.gov. 
They are available for $15 plus shipping and handling, and you can order them directly from Amazon. So I think we are all set to go, and first up is Dr. Joe Mitchell. Thank you for your time. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for attending the seminar. Um, it's my job to kind of introduce you to do the to the series. Oops, sorry. Back. Park is a is a, is a kind of a unique organization that was formed in 1999, and the mission statement is to conserve amphibians, reptiles, and their habitats as integral parts of our ecosystem and culture through proactive and coordinated public-private partnerships. And we focus on the partnerships. That's a very important part of what we do. We, we engage everybody at the table. Um, the photo is, uh, is, uh, is of a uh, workshop that we had last year in Alabama. And it uh, included classroom presentations and discussions and then several field trips. And this is, this is, the, uh, this is the group that we had last year. We had a lot. Of good, we had a lot of fun. It was, it was really good. Um, first of all, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Wildlife Conservation Branch and Biological Resources Division of the National Park Service for funding this webinar series and making it possible. Hmm. Uh, who is Park? Park's a diverse group of professional biologists, natural resource managers, like-minded citizens, and an organization that works toward uh, reptile and amphibian conservation. They're federal agencies state agencies, all of them, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, university uh, academics, zoos, professional societies, and so on. And uh, we, all, we, uh, we all work together in one place. Park and its partners have developed useful tools to help with management conservation of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, the one on the left is the Inventory Monitoring Handbook, and that one has a, a number of techniques. Uh, or actually a very good review of the techniques that one needs to, to inventory these animals and techniques to monitor them. So the one in the middle is the uh, Priority Amphibian Reptile Conservation Areas book, and that one identifies um, basically biodiversity hotspots in each of the uh, park regions. And on the right is the uh, first of the Regional Habitat Management Guidelines. And that, that one is for the, it's for the southeast. And the webinar is largely based on things that are in this book. Um, there are numerous other publications that can help land managers accomplish their conservation goals. We need more books, like the one on the amphibians on the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The one on the, on, on the right is the State of the Union publication by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And that contains a lot, uh, quite a bit of information, that, uh, useful information as well. Uh, there are many, many examples, um, and I'll just say that we need more like this Smoky Mountain book. Park is divided into five regions. I think we've used the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, regions outlines, and uh, there is also a number of state chapters, uh, and we also include Canada and Mexico, and uh, we have cooperators in both of those countries as well. In the southeast are 82 national parks of various sorts, uh, historic sites, battlefields, seashores, heritage corridors, recreation areas, scenic rivers, and tra scenic trails. So it's quite a, it covers hey, quite Joe. a diversity of... Joe, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but both Mark and I are having the same problem where we are only seeing your first slide. That's my, this is Kurt, and I'm just texting Jen a message. I, I, it has never moved. It's been on the first slide yeah. and I figured I was texting trying to hoping it I'm the only problem but it looks like you all we're all having yeah. a problem Joe. So I think we need to start re-recording. I wonder if you just have your slideshow open Joe and that you're not showing your screen uh, or something. It says now viewing Joe Mitchell's screen so I don't see I don't know what happened here. I don't know. Oh, you don't know, see my advances to the next slide? Nope. No. no it's all the title slide. No advances. Slide. No open on title slide from the beginning. Sorry, I should have stopped you. We should have stopped you earlier, but I, I guess we were all afraid that it was yep, we were exactly the lone problem, <laughs> but obviously we're all having the same problem. So why don't we right. stop recording, get it figured out, and we can re-record. Does that sound okay? Sure. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry guys. Welcome to Conservation and Management of Amphibians and Reptiles for US National Parks in the Southeast. This is the final in a four-part series. 
My name is Jen Williams. I'm the Federal Coordinator for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. We will provide breaks during the presentations for questions, and the presenters will announce when those times are available. This way, you don't have to wait until the end of the webinar to ask your questions. But throughout the webinar, you can um, type in your questions into the questions or chat box that are provided in your navigation panel. And then during the question period, I will, re I will read your questions to the presenters. Um, and we are recording today. The, um, we're already in recording mode. Please email me at jen underscore williams at nps.gov to obtain a recording of the webinar. But we will also have the recordings posted on par the PARC website. Um, and there's also a PARC YouTube channel where you can um, gain access to the recordings as well. So I'm going to provide you a little bit of information about today's speakers. Mark Bailey has an MS in zoology from Auburn University. And Mark has been active in the conservation and management of southeastern wildlife with an emphasis on herpetofauna for over 30 years. Mark has worked for the US Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy before establishing his own consulting firm, which is known as Conservation Southeast. He is a past Alabama State representative, representative to the Gopher Tortoise Council, and he currently serves on the board of the Alabama Wildlife Federation. Along with the other co-authors of Park's Habitat Management Guidelines for the Southeastern United States, he is a recipient of the Florida Wildlife Society's Paul Moeller Herpetological Conservation Award. And Mark is also co-author of Turtles of Alabama. The next presenter will be Joe Mitchell. And Joe has a PhD in ecology from the University of Tennessee. And he's focused on the conservation, ecology, and natural history of amphibians and reptiles for over 40 years. Joe is self-employed and has conducted conservation and management research on 16 national parks and 21 military bases, among other federal properties. Joe wrote the first habitat conservation plan under a joint venture by two federal agencies, the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Joe is the author of The Reptiles of Virginia, which was published on the Smithsonian Institution Press. And he is senior editor of Urban Herpetology, which is published under the Society for the Study of Amphibians and Reptiles. And finally, we have Kurt Buhlman, who holds a BS in Environmental Studies from Stockton State College in New Jersey. He has an MS in Wildlife Sciences from Virginia Tech. And he got his PhD in Ecology from the University of Georgia. Kurt has worked with the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Service, Conservation International, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and others um, along the way as well. He is currently a senior research associate with the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Laboratory. And Kurt also operates Buhlman Ecological Research and Consulting, LLC, as an environmental consultant. Kurt's research interests include life history and evolutionary ecology with application for species recovery, conservation, and management. Kurt has studied terrestrial habitat needs of amphibians and reptiles around seasonal wetlands. Um, he has investigated the effects of prescribed fire, control of invasive species, and wetland restoration. Kurt has been involved with turtle habitat management and restoration projects. And he has helped implement reintroduction strategies for gopher tortoises at several sites in the southeast. And more recently, he has been involved with head starting research with freshwater turtles, such as the Blandings turtle and wood turtle in the northeast, as well as with desert tortoises in the Mojave Desert. And the fourth author on this um, habitat management guidelines is Jeff Holmes. Jeff is the executive director for the Amphibian and Reptile Conservancy. Um, Jeff was unable to be here today due to his um, field work that had to be conducted during this time. But I think we are all ready to start, so take it away, Joe. OK, great. Thank you, Jen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today, I think. PARC is a very interesting and I think kind of a unique organization. Uh, it was formed in 1999, but our mission statement is to conserve amphibians and reptiles and their habitats as integral parts of our ecosystem and culture through proactive and coordinated public and private partnerships. And we stress the partnerships. We want everybody to the table. Uh, the photograph shows the uh, participants in the uh, workshop that we did last year in Alabama about a year ago. And uh, we have both uh, classroom and field trips. 
and it turned out to be a very good experience for everybody. Uh, first of all, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Wildlife Conservation Branch and the Biological Resources Division of the National Park Service for funding this webinar series and making it possible. So who's part? Um, it's a diverse group of professional biologists, natural resource managers, like-minded citizens and organizations who work towards inclusive reptile and amphibian conservation. And there are many, many uh, participants in part, federal agencies, state wildlife agencies, NGOs, uh, academics, zoos, professional societies, consultants, and individuals, actually. Uh, Park and its partners have developed a number of useful tools to help with management and conservation of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, the first on the left is the Inventory and Monitoring Handbook. And this one includes uh, a number of methods uh, to both inventory uh, various groups of amphibians and reptiles, and it's actually pretty complex, and uh, also provides uh, uh, directions for monitoring those populations. The second one is the uh, PARCA, or Park uh, Priority of Amphibian Reptile Conservation Areas. And PARC has identified, uh, well, I guess we'll call them hotspots, country that we that we need to focus on in terms of uh, conserving these animals. And on the right is the uh, Re Regional Habitat Management Guidelines. And the one illustrated is the first one we did, and it's on the southeast. There are a number of other park, uh, non-park publications specific to your National Park Service unit that are available. Uh, the one on the left is the Amphibians of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park by Ken Dodd. And uh, the one on the right is a publication by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, a State of the Union, and it talks about legal authority over these animals. And there, there are, there's a need for all of those, especially at more amphibian, more, more books like the Amphibians of Great Smoky Mountains. I wish, I wish every national park had one of those. The uh, park is divided into five regions. Uh, we, we follow the Fish and Wildlife Service regional boundaries. Um, and in addition to the five regions, oh, the five regions actually, actually uh, overlap in Canada and Mexico. Uh, and, we, and those people are partners in the organization as well. And we have a number of state chapters uh, which, which have their own meetings actually annually. There are uh, 82 national park lands in the southeast. Um, the historic sites, battlefields, seashores, uh, heritage corridors, recreation areas, scenic rivers and scenic trails, and so on. So there's a very wide diversity of habitats and environments that are encompassed by all of these national parks. The ecoregions are quite diverse in this region as well. And I uh, want, to, want to point out a couple things. Um, red line is the fall line, and this to show the, de the delineation between the coastal plain uh, and, the, and the other regions. And this is a very important point, which we'll get to later. Um, these ecoregions do not uh, adhere to uh, park boundaries, of course. And uh, they, they, they overlap with other regions. And so the HMGs for those additional, uh, uh, for the surrounding uh, regions, uh, are also applicable to the, the southeast. So, don't, don't ignore those, because they might be very useful as well. Um, amphibians and reptiles have really lagged behind other taxonomic groups in research and habitat management and conservation, and, under, and I'll underscore funding. Uh, we need to understand the biology and the life history in order to effectively manage them. Many species use both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, and they, they exhibit a a very wide variety in their life histories and how they respond to environmental cues. Um, the total that we have so far is about 246. There may be a couple more depending on who's splitting what. And uh, uh, quite a few non-native species, most of them in Florida, and most of those are lizards. Um, the, the diversity in the southeast is quite remarkable. Uh, we hold 13 percent of the entire global salamander community, and 13 percent of the, the entire turtle group. Um, in addition to that, there are quite a few species that only occur only occur in this region. In fact, they're, they're endemics. And examples are listed in the, to have, are noted in the list. And the uh, one on the right is a Barber's, Barber's Map Turtle, and the Pigeon Mountain Salamander, and the Webster Salamander. And I believe all of those three are state, state protected. 
and the one on the right is not, but it's a striped crayfish snake. How do we secure bio, uh, viable populations? How do we make that work? Protecting habitats and national parks is an important part of conservation. However, it may not be enough. It may not be enough to, uh, to adequately protect amphibian and reptile populations. Uh, we must be uh, aware of the. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. We must be aware of the shifting baseline. This is a phrase coined by a fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly in 1995. It provides information against which to evaluate change. The baseline is the, is the starting point, but information on that reference point was taken after other changes have been have been made. If the baseline shifted before we had a chance to chart it, then we end up accepting a degraded state as normal. The abundance of animals we see is less than their grandfathers and the, and the grandfathers before them. And uh, we accept less because we don't know any better. So, the, so, so our, our, our point of reference is shifting. So what keeps us up at night? Well, I can tell you that loss of biodiversity and extinction keeps us up at night. Uh, we're very concerned about that. And of course, you know the, the Carolina parakeet and the pasture pigeon. This, this one keeps us all up at night. Um, this is the uh, frosted flatwood salamanders. There are two species. and um, but this, these are, these are federally protected. I think they're both federally threatened. I don't think they've reached endangered shipwreck status yet, but they should be. Um, the panel on the right shows all of the records that people were able to pull up out of museum records and whatever other ways that they can find the occurrences. And in the middle panel is a 2000-2009 situation uh, for both of these species. And you know that this has been dramatic loss of the number of populations in the species. Um, and the one below that is the, uh, this, the situation between 2010 and 2015, and it's another dramatic drop in uh, number of population, number of places where these, where these animals occur. Um, the uh, reticulated pl uh, flatwood salamander only occurs on Eglin Air Force Base, and there's a one, one county in southeastern Georgia, and that is it. So again, we're very, very concerned about this animal. To work with amphibians and reptiles, you really need to know uh, something about the, their natural history. Uh, their ectothermic, some people call it blow, uh, cold, cold blooded. Um, that, of course, that means they are they respond to temperature changes in the environment. Okay. They can be inactive for long periods of time. They can sit out droughts and and uh, winter conditions. They're very cryptic and mostly solitary. And a lot of them use now multiple habitats and terrestrial habitats both. Some frogs, for example, have widely fluctuating populations in response to environmental changes. And they all play important roles as predators and prey. And many of these uh, species have, are surprisingly long-lived. And some take 10 to 20 years or more to reach sexual maturity and reproductive senility. This turtle, a landing turtle, was, was caught going to her nesting site. And she is 70, uh, she, uh, at least nine years older than the 75-year-old researcher who has been working with her since the 1970s. So they know each other really well. Um, one of the things that PARC does is produce the habitat management guidelines. And these have become very, very popular and very useful. Um, in these guidelines, we have two different sets of recommendations, depending on your focus. One is for land managers who want to make amphibian and reptile conservation their primary goal. And the other set of recommendations is for land managers who wish to contribute to the conservation of these animals while managing land for multiple uses. When applied on the ground as general management principles, these guidelines will promote conservation of amphibians by keeping common species common, and that's an important issue, stemming the decline of imperiled species, finding restoration of amphibian reptile habitats, and reducing the likelihood that additional species will be added to endangered species list. Each of the habitat management guidelines contains a section of common conservation challenges. Um, a lot of these things cut across boundaries, and so we, we have sections that we that each one of them talks about uh, various aspects of these challenges. Uh, habitat alteration and fragmentation, impacts of roads, uh, invasive and introduced species like the the uh, Cuban tree frog and the uh, Burmese python noted here. 
uh, exploitation is a big issue, and uh, landscape scale and habitat connectivity is a, is, a, is a way that we need to look at conservation of these animals. Uh, additional challenges are improper use of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, restoration of habitats and populations of common species, such as the southern hognose snake, is you know, in areas that were destroyed. We, so we are focusing somewhat on, re on restoration, not just protection. Management of special habitat features, such as seepages and rock outcrops. Fire suppression, that's a really big deal. You'll see some information on that later. Uh, problem with subsidized predators, like the raccoon. Uh, and public education about the aesthetic, ecological, and spiritual value of wildlife. That needs to be done all the time. So, what, so how do we do this? The first thing to do is to conduct a biological inventory. Uh, you need to know what you have. So identify potential amphibians and reptile habitats. You, know, you need to know what the habitats are, so you need to map, map the locations. Identify the species known or suspected to occur in each of these habitats. And then identify current management objectives for each one of those. So learn what you have before you establish a real monitoring program. Um, one thing we all need to be aware of uh, is that there are a number of uh, laws, uh, regulations and laws that um, that uh, direct what you can and cannot do to these animals. And so make 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 sure that you uh, uh, are aware of all of these things. So at this point, uh, we can take questions. If Jen has anything. Um, thanks, Joe. We actually don't have any questions that rolled in at this time, so I think that we okay. can um, just continue. All right. Switching it over to Mark. Okay, folks. Uh, just a quick check. Are you able to see my screen, Jen? Yep. Okay. We sure are. I also hope... Okay, great. I hope the audio is good uh, on your end. I'm hearing some dropouts, but uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, Greetings, everybody, from South Alabama. This is the list of the 18 habitats that uh, we uh, ended up putting in the habitat management guidelines. Of course, we had to lump some things together, and uh, it was a little bit of a challenge deciding what to come up with. But I won't read the entire list. You can scan this, and I'm sure you'll see that there's some that uh, fit the uh, situations that you're uh, dealing with on the lands that you're uh, working on. There are uh, four of these, uh, two terrestrial and uh, three of the aquatics that uh, I'm going to touch on a little more detail. They're the ones that are in the uh, bullface blue. Uh, and uh, I'll move on to uh, the mesic hardwood forest type, the first one. This is a, a, a widespread habitat uh, found in, I suppose, all, all of our states here in the southeast, uh, more, more some areas than others. Uh, a large number of species uh, in this habitat. Um, of course, uh, salamanders are uh, characteristic. We have a, a, great, a higher genetic diversity in the families and genera of salamanders in the southern Appalachian Mountains than anywhere else in the world. So this uh, uh, salamander depicted here is one of the prettier ones, the, uh, the Yanalasi salamander. Uh, threats to this habitat are uh, there are some unique ha unique threats and others that are common to, uh, to to just about all of our habitats, uh, but fragmentation, of course, and outright loss to development uh, top the list of threats. But there's a number of other uh, challenges, uh, including invasive species and uh, even uh, overabundance of native species, uh, such as uh, white-tailed deer, and, and of course. Uh, uh, under the invasive, uh, uh, there's some invasive plants up above that last bullet, but the feral hogs are an invasive uh, uh, animal that we need to uh, be on the lookout for. Um, to repeat what uh, what Joe said earlier uh, about the uh, our, our, our guidelines, we broke them down into two categories, uh, the ideal and uh, maximizing compatibility, we call them. Now, what you see on this slide is the ideal uh, guidelines. And, and th these ideal guidelines are intended for managers whose primary objective is the conservation of the native biodiversity on, on their lands. Now, if you're managing a cultural site like a battlefield, these might not be, uh, be the ones that apply 
most to you, but I think it's a safe assumption that most of the National Park Service managers find that this ideal management category is more aligned uh, to their objectives. And uh, what we should be looking for in this habitat in terms of uh, our, our management goals, we, we need uh, or should be striving for having uh, more mature stands uh, with, with lots of logs uh, on the ground, you know, fallen, fallen uh, witty debris. That's uh, so important to, to a number of uh, species of uh, ground-dwelling uh, reptiles and amphibians. Uh, limiting disturbance, fragmentation, especially uh, fragmentation from, from roads is, is very important. Um, and uh, often we need to be considering the migration requirements of uh, uh, amphibians, uh, especially uh, more so than reptiles. Uh, you, you may have an entire population of winter breeding uh, salamanders or frogs uh, that, that cross the same road uh, twice uh, annually, uh, not to mention the metamorphs that are coming back out of the breeding site having to cross that road. Um, we, we have a colleague, uh, Tom Mann, in, in uh, Mississippi who's uh, studying the migration of Webster's salamanders and other species, spotted salamanders and a few others, uh, on, the, on the Natchez Trace. And uh, documenting a lot of uh, uh, road, road mortality, of course, and, and learning a lot about uh, what these animals need in terms of uh, management. Now, the last bullet on this slide, uh, controlling deer and uh, hog populations, somehow it didn't make it into our 2006 uh, habitat guidelines. Uh, it, it should have been on our radar then, and uh, it just didn't make it in. And that just illustrates the need for making these guidelines uh, a, a, a dynamic document and I'm sure in future uh, revisions, this is going to be something that we'll be emphasizing more because it's a, it's a serious issue. Uh, just an example here, uh, what you might encounter with uh, overpopulation of deer, which, which is frequently what you're going to have in a park situation where hunting is, is uh, restricted or, or not permitted. Uh, you may have complete loss of understory vegetation. All the palatable browse is, is gone, and uh, that's saplings that are not making it up into the canopy, uh, so in the long term uh, it's going to drastically affect what this uh, forest is going to look like in terms of structure and species composition. Or you could have a situation on the right where you've lost the preferred browse by the deer, but th th there's other uh, plants that they are often uh, invasive exotics like privet, which deer aren't that crazy about chewing on, uh, and you may have have those species uh, displacing the, uh, the desirable uh, na native ones. And under our secondary uh, uh, tier of management guidelines, the maximizing compatibility, that's where you may be needing to manage for uh, multiple use. Uh, the, the things like uh, eliminating migration uh, barriers, again, very, very important. The sensible placement of, of trails, like the one depicted here, uh, you don't want to run this through uh, a, a sensitive wetland or too near a, a breeding site uh, for amphibians, that sort of thing. Uh, leaving snags and logs and avoiding uh, disturbance to the soil uh, wherever possible. You, soil disturbance just tends to lead to lots of problems, including uh, uh, invasive species moving in. Now I'm talking to you from down here in the middle of the Connecticut National Forest uh, on the Alabama side of the Florida boundary. Looking out my window right now, it's longly fine. And uh, th this is one of my favorite habitats. And I've uh, done a lot of work in, in this area. And uh, to, to me, uh, you just can't talk about pine forests without uh, emphasizing the importance of, uh, of fire. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. This is the species list, uh, almost 100 species we have. It, it, and it doesn't just include the longleaf, but um, shortleaf, slash pine, other species like that. But uh, getting back to the ha habitat uh, or the, the management uh, requirements, see bullet number two there, I would have put it at the top. Well, I did the slide, so I should have put it at the top. <laughs> but uh, using prescribed burns is uh, is critical. If we don't burn the forests periodically, uh, they lose their, their, uh, na their natural character. Uh, plant species compositions shift and uh, structure changes and eventually species like the eastern indigo snake and the eastern diamondback rattlesnake and the gopher frog and the, uh, so many others, Florida pine snake, uh, southern hognose, are going to disappear. They'll, they'll persist for a while and they can, they, they can, they can hang on in some, some messed up places, but uh, the, 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 the habitat they evolved in is open 
a fire maintained uh, pine savanna, and uh, it's, it's really what they need for for the long haul. Uh, first bullet there talks about protecting unique habitat features within uh, the forest. That we, we, we all sometimes forget that there's habitats embedded within other habitats, and, and we have uh, modules in the habitat management guidelines that specifically talks about ephemeral wetlands. In fact, that, that's one coming up. So is springs, uh, rock outcrops, other places like that. Um, Jumping down to bullet three there, avoid fragmentation. That that pretty much goes for all of our habitats. And then there's the invasive uh, issue again. We need to be on the lookout. One of the problems we have in the southern pine forests uh, is uh, kogan grass. Uh, it displaces a lot of other native plants, and even gopher tortoises don't live in a thick patch of, of kogan grass. Uh, the, our second tier, maximizing compatibility. Not the ideal, but maximizing uh, maximizing. Uh, Minimizing barriers to dispersing between habitats. Of course, that applies to both maximizing and ideal. I would say, keep keep some woody debris on the forest floor uh, if, whenever possible between the fire cycles. Uh, restore the natural fire, fire frequency if you can, uh, in terms of intensity and seasonality. It's not always possible when you've got other management objectives. Uh, if you're really managing for maximizing your species. Uh, Comp your, your native species composition, the diversity and abundance, you do need to c try to get that natural fire frequency and intensity and seasonality all, all ticked off your list. Um, large clear cuts are, uh, are, are probably not a, not a very good thing in just about any habitat. Uh, small, small patch clear cuts uh, are, are a different situation. Here's a, a photo of just a dense pine plantation and there's just nothing growing on the ground. And, uh, you're not going to find uh, very very many uh, plants or animals on the ground below that kind of uh, canopy. I can't uh, stop talking about fire here. Uh, I'll just read the box at the top. Prescribed fire is a tool used by land managers to alter forest or grassland habitats in such a way as to restore or maintain the desired forest structure. Desirable to stimulate natural growth of the na native understory plants and to maintain a natural ecosystem. We, we have to consider what our objectives are before we burn. Just just blackening the ground uh, is not good enough. Saying we burned 500 acres last year uh, on our 1,000 acre track we're managing, well, what does that really mean? Well, was it done in the middle of the winter or was it done in uh, in May or June? Uh, it makes a huge difference. Uh, are, are we trying to restore a habitat or are we trying to maintain a habitat? A, a winter fire can can uh, maintain a habitat a lot better than it can uh, restore a habitat. It's just not going to cut it, as, as Kurt is going to talk about in, in a bit. Another concern is uh, you know, the season of fire, and uh, I think uh, Kurt will likely also mention something about uh, the effects of uh, non-growing season burns on uh, amphibians that might be uh, in, in dangerous places in the, in the wintertime during their migrations. And they're migrating to these seasonal isolating isolated wetlands. Uh, a, a lot of amphibians uh, depend heavily on these. I did my research uh, when I was at Auburn on gopher frogs and they, they breed in these sites and I was catching all kinds of other animals along with them, tiger salamanders, uh, mole salamanders, and chicken turtles like this, which again I think Kurt's got a few things to say about. Uh, my breeding, the site I worked at looked a little bit like the one here in the lower right, although it was a lot smaller. Um, Animals that uh, breed in these ponds often come from some distance away, so to, to manage uh, ideally for them, you need to have a, a, a large uh, upland uh, area uh, that, that extends out many hundreds of meters, if possible, from, from the pond itself. Just preserving a little 100-foot uh, you know, buffer around the pond is, is not, uh, not going to cut it. You've got to have some, some distance out there because that's where these animals live. It's where they overwinter. Or, eat or, or spend their summers in some cases. Um, maintaining the natural uh, hydrologic period of the wetlands is important. Of course, one reason these isolated wetlands are important to amphibians is they don't have fish in them because they dry periodically. But some of them hold water often long enough that people are tempted to stock fish in them, and uh, it can be a be a real problem to that that years or those few years of. Uh, uh, reproductive success of the amphibian populations. Uh, preventing vehicle traffic 
uh, that's not such an issue, hopefully, on national park lands, but I have seen some horrible, uh, horribly disturbed uh, artificial I mean, <laughs> natural ponds in uh, the national forests uh, in some areas. Fortunately, I don't see that here on the Conecuh, but in other places. The uh, amphibian uh, larva uh, density in these ponds can be huge. And uh, these animals are metamorphosing and moving up into the uplands and contributing to the uh, the, the energy cycling of the uh, of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, the, the, even animals like hawks and and and, and foxes uh, have uh, have have some of the energy that came from these, uh, these these animals that had moved up into the uplands were fed on by other predators. Uh, to maximize compatibility, if you have other objectives, uh, again, maintaining some connectivity between the wetlands is extremely important. And uh, sometimes fertilizers or pesticides are used in the vicinity of wetlands. It has to be done. Uh, minimize that to the extent that you're just achieving your objectives and, and not, not overdoing it. Uh, don't disturb the wetlands or alter them. And to the extent you can, restore them. That can be done. These uh, permanent wetlands are uh, uh, all across the landscape and occur in a variety of forms. It can be beaver ponds, such as this one, which I suppose isn't absolutely permanent, but for all intents and purposes, these last for decades, sometimes even centuries. And uh, we have river oxbows, sinkholes, uh, even man-made ponds and, and lakes. And uh, of course, one characteristic that separates them from the uh, isolated wetlands is they have fish in them. And, uh, the characteristic species would be uh, common snapping turtle, you see here. But um, frogs, salamanders, turtles, lizards, and snakes, all, uh, well, lizards, not just zero for that. I guess we could think of some lizards that are around the periphery, periphery of these. But uh, it's important to many of these groups. And uh, ideal management, maintain the natural vegetation uh, and the wetlands around the margins. Think about a uh, golf course pond that uh, is mowed and manicured right up to the edge. Uh, there's just uh, very little uh, uh, suitable habitat for most of the animals that would otherwise be able to use these these places. Avoid the introduction of exotic uh, species. Uh, maintain structure. If uh, if there are no snags or basking logs, uh, it's really going to affect uh, the turtle populations. They need those for uh, you know, thermoregulation. Um, again, providing some buffer of natural vegetation. And uh, anytime you can uh, provide information to the public through uh, signs or pamphlets, brochures, uh, outreach, that, that goes a long way. Again, there's a, there's a big old American bullfrog tadpole and what, what, he, what he can turn into. Um, maintaining water levels during the winter when these animals are hibernating is really critical. Uh, a lot of people don't think about this, but uh, these turtles, are uh, spending the winter on the bottom of the pond, uh, for the most part. Some some don't. Uh, the chicken turtles are, are maybe in the uplands, but the, the, the sliders and some of the uh, painted turtles and others are down on the bottom in the muck, uh, under the sometimes under ice even. And uh, if that water is drawn down uh, to a uh, level that that's below where these animals are, uh, they're going to die in the winter time. Uh, a lot of times beaver dams are blown out to, for, for beaver control uh, in, in the cooler months. And uh, when that happens, it probably results in uh, pretty high turtle mortality in some situations. Um, next bullet down, minimizing or excluding pesticides and fertilizers ne next door to these wetlands. Uh, of course, something to always be aware of. And uh, there's the conservation-related educational materials again. We, the more we can educate people, uh, the better. I think the uh, last one I've got here is uh, the small streams, springs, and seeps uh, habitat. These are, of course, extremely important to uh, salamanders. Look, look at the look at the species list there. You know, and, and salamanders are off the chart compared to the other groups there. Uh, this is a really pretty one, the northern red salamander that we probably have in, I guess, all of our states in the southeast, just about. Um, ideally, ideally, when you're managing these, you, you need to uh, either maintain or restore that native vegetation along the shoreline. Uh, of course, we're past the, hopefully we're past this time when we're channelizing streams, and, and now we're in a position where we're able to actually restore these co contours and meanders of streams, and that's something uh, to do if you, if you possibly can. Maintain uh, the wetlands nearby, and in the case of some of these smaller streams, they may be large enough to 
have uh, nesting beaches for, uh, uh, for, some, for some of the turtles in a nesting beach or a, a beach of any kind, a sandbar basically, is real attractive to campers and uh, folks just out, you know, having a good time. And uh, sometimes we have to steer people away from those sites if, if it's being used by the only uh, few, you know, turtles that are that are inhabiting that area. Uh, providing those siltation barriers alongside streams is uh, often uh, the, the very very effective. Sometimes they fail, but it's better to use them if there's something going on nearby that disturbs the soil than, than not to, of course. And, and local regulations often stipulate that. Uh, try not to alter the flow or the temperature re regime. Restrict access, as I said, to the uh, sandbars, places where you may have. And there's the uh, education bullet again. So that was just a run through of uh, five of the habitats. And uh, each one is covered, of course, in a lot more detail in the habitat management guidelines. And uh, I think that uh, wraps up. Here's some photos from down here in the National Forest where I am. And if there are any questions, uh, we can do that now or in, uh, pass it on to Kurt, who's up next. Um, thanks, Mark. That was a lot of great information. Um, we actually do have one comment and one question. Um, somebody had suggested for us to discuss the voucher documentation of species on national park properties. And um, the presenters are actually going to provide a handout with some useful resources um, that I will email out to everybody after this webinar. But in that handout, you will see um, you know exactly where you need to contact um, NPS staff for um, any kind of research that's conducted on NPS uh, park units. So um, she will have that information provided to you. But there's actually a question for the group as well. Um, Mark, are you or Joe or Kurt aware of any detailed BMPs for herbicide application with respect to minimizing impacts to herbs? apart from the general info that's already offered in the habitat management guidelines. I, this is Mark, and I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of any specific BMPs along those lines. Maybe, Kurt, do you, do you have any, uh, any, um, anything I'm on that? that I'm going to try to um, give some examples of different herbicides that we might use in some of the different habitats, but each one of those herbicides clearly has their own uh, regulations and their own very careful instructions that the users need to understand. And in many cases, uh, there's even an applicator's license or you know some classwork that really should go along with using herbicides. So uh, we're going to talk about a few herbicides that have specific uses that are, can be very helpful to us. But I think we need to uh, think about some real um, detailed, some more information about uh, the specific regs for how to use some of these herbicides. Hmm. Okay, so this is Mark again. I, I, did you, sorry, Jen, I think I'm on a time delay. I, I, one thing I failed to interject back when I was talking about the fire, I, I wanted to mention that there's a, a book uh, that's about to be published by uh, Reed Noss, uh, University of Florida Press, coming out next year. It's titled Evolutionary Ecology of Fire in Florida and the Southeastern Coastal Plain. And it's going to be a really useful uh, resource for uh, for a lot of folks, I believe. And I think, uh, aren't we going to be able to provide a, a link to that as well? Yeah, we can provide that um, in the handout of resources that we provide to the group. So we'll try to get that handout um, finished up and sent out within the next week or so. Great. And then I've also been asked for the email addresses for the presenters, and um, that information will be included in that research, resource handout as well. So, but I think we're all set to start with Kurt's portion. Okay. All right. Um, hello, I'm Kurt Buhlman, and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm hoping to build on what Joe and Mark have talked about and maybe relate some specific examples of species uh, that we can manage the habitats for with specific benefits uh, that you can see on the ground. And so it's actions that all of you as land managers can actually do. It's kind of where the rubber meets the road. 
It's um, so that we actually can have some specific examples here for each of what I've taken is seven habitat types. And I'm hoping to use a habitat and a species to generally illustrate uh, some, some habitat management for that benefits those species. So we'll look at some pine forest savannas for gopher tortoise management, a hardwood forest ravine for Webster's salamander, which you've already heard some about today. Uh, I should mention that the gopher tortoise is a listed species in the western part of its range in Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, it's a species of state concern in the east, in Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, I believe so in Alabama as well. Um, in the hardwood forest, we're going to look at Webster's salamander, which is a very localized woodland salamander uh, in South Carolina. It's a species of concern, uh, and it occurs in the Sumter National Forest. Uh, we're going to look at maybe some management for longleaf pine flatwoods for the flatwood salamander that you heard Joe mention uh, earlier. And that is a, uh, basically two species, and they are both federally listed species, and they deserve to be. They are high concern species for all of us. We look at some seasonal wetlands and how not only management of the wetlands with uh, fire, but also the importance of terrestrial habitat around those wetlands as well, and the, uh, the amount of terrestrial habitat we need for some species like chicken turtles and gopher frogs, which are state-list species in some areas, not federally listed. Um, last, we're going to look at some river sandbars and maybe think about how we might improve nesting habitats that Mark just recently hinted at there when he was talking about the streams and springs, uh, and look at how we might manage some habitat for map turtles, some federally listed, some state listed. Um, I'm going to then just hit two habitats that haven't been talked about uh, here. One is the salt marshes and how we might do some things for diamondback terrapins, and an example of permanent wetlands, how we might do some things for bog turtles. So with that, let me go right into a first habitat that I'm really excited about, and this is the longleaf pine savanna. And I say savanna with emphasis because if you came to South Carolina or anywhere in the southeast in the 1790s, as William Bartram did, uh, he was a naturalist who went through the South Carolina countryside, and he said you could gallop a horse through the South Carolina country, low country, all afternoon. Well, you can't gallop a horse through this habitat now. And we think about that is a longleaf pine forest, and we're doing a prescribed burn here to try to benefit that habitat. But that's a winter burn. Uh, the trees are very thick, and it's not going to become tortoise habitat under these conditions. It will maintain in that condition. But if we want to restore it to go for tortoise habitat, we're going to have to do some other things. We may have, as it's listed in the left here, we may have to actually mechanically remove some trees, thin that out a little bit. We may be using some herbicides to control mid-story oak growth. And velipar, uh, granulated velipar, is one of the um, herbicides that can be very helpful uh, in this. And it actually really does a great job of knocking out the mid-story oaks, especially if it's applied um, and used in conjunction with fire. The two of them are like a one-two punch. Um, growing season burning uh, seems to be very important for managing the longleaf pine forest. For example, wiregrass, which is the predominant desired understory clump grass, um, will actually seed, produce seed, if it's burned in the summer growing months, but it only vegetatively re-sprouts in the winter. So some examples here in the lower left corner, in the center is a fairly open-looking habitat of what we may think of as a longleaf pine savanna. I'll also point out that there's also a ringed metal ring and circle in the center, and that's actually a site we're actually using as a gopher tortoise reintroduction site. So besides trying to restore longleaf pine savanna, sometimes we have to restore the species as well. And this is, we don't have time to really discuss that in this program here, but that is something that I'd like the viewers to consider, that it's not always about just restoring the habitat, but we may have to take additional steps to restore species. I will also notice in the, in the lower part of this photo on the left, that basically is the forest that you see the forester burning in the, in the larger picture here. So again, showing that same picture here, growing season fires are going to give us the habitat we want, which is really a longleaf pine savanna. 
And in these cases, and Mark mentioned it, we're looking at restoration. In many cases, we want to be able to open the habitat more, and that may require some thinning of trees, growing season burns, and then we get that habitat to end up looking like the picture down below that the dog's walking through, which basically looks like that open savanna. And I believe that probably is what William Bartram was talking about in 1790 when he galloped the horse through the South Carolina low country for an entire afternoon. So that's the habitat I think we're looking for. Uh, certainly we want to try to get gopher tortoises restored on those habitats. They need these open, sunny ground covers. They need a diversity of, of plants that you will not have in a closed canopy pine forest. Mark showed that one picture with nothing but pine needles underneath. And we also need sunny areas for those turtles, for uh, turtles to actually uh, nest and hatchlings to emerge. And you see a hatchling right here. There's other issues we need to think about when we're managing for the southeastern pine forest, and that includes some invasive species. And besides plants, like kogun grass that Mark might have mentioned earlier, there's things like fire ants, uh, Solenopsis invicta, which are a real problem for reptiles and amphibians here in the southeast. And we all need to be aware of that, and we all need to be looking at ways to uh, deal with fire ants, because um, I don't think I'm the only one who believes that they are responsible for the declines in a lot of reptile and amphibian species and probably other invertebrates and ground nesting birds and things as well. And we all need to be very alert for that here in the future. Anyway, this is an example of a habitat that we want for gopher tortoises. This is actually the Aiken Gopher Tortoise Heritage Preserve. It's in uh, South Carolina. It's a state managed area. And it's be, been managed over the last 10 years to be a good habitat for gopher tortoises, and they're being reintroduced at that site. I'm going to look at, uh, I don't have time for uh, to get too much detail, but here is the hardwood forest uh, habitat. And a perfect example of a hardwood forest denizen uh, is a Webster salamander, which you've heard about already. Uh, they have a very spotty range in the southeast. And these particular salamanders here in South Carolina are just restricted to the Sumter National Forest. Um, they're in hardwood ravines. And in many cases, they are in ravines that have this history of not being clear cut and disturbed or farmed. And I'll relate back to what Joe mentioned early on about the shifting baseline paradigm and knowing what habitat looked like in the past. We have a horrible history of land management on the Piedmont, especially in South Carolina. Uh, and there's and there just areas where the streams are badly eroded, the topsoil is gone, and you just have red clay soils. Um, but there are other areas where there's much better uh, conditions in these ravines. And no, not surprisingly, that tends to be where some of these Webster salamander populations are. I'm going to show a particular example right here in the upper upper left is a beech hardwood forest, uh, and it has some very old loblolly pines in it as well. And this was one of the better sites when we did surveys for Webster salamanders. And not surprisingly, when we went to the aerial photos and looked at a 1940s aerial photo, we find that where the salamanders are today was still forested habitat in the 1940s. And when we looked at this, the history of that stand with the, with the Sumter National Forest, we found that that stand wasn't cut since 1898. So not surprisingly that these two pictures are the same, this stream corridor here and this stream corridor here are the same picture. We have a 1940s picture and a 2015 picture, and we see that that's where the salamanders are. And so the history of the landscape is very important to us in our land management. I would also uh, direct folks' attention to this Earth Explorer website. I find it incredibly useful for getting old aerial photos of lands that you want to look at. And all you really need is a, is a lap latitude and longitude point, you type it in, and you ask for, you can get photos back in some cases all the way to the early 1930s. I want to just point out that it's not only a matter of the, his, the history of the site, the long-term history, but we can go do a survey and wonder why we don't see salamanders today, um, but we find that it, it, it looks pretty good. It's all forested. But if we go back to 1990, we find that, that there was an area that was clear-cut right next to that ravine. 
it didn't clear cut the ravine, but just allowing the sunlight and the warmer temperatures uh, in on that ravine for 10 years or so, probably heated it up, dried it out, and those salamanders are gone. Um, because they have such limited isolated distributions, recolonization in our humanized landscape is really difficult. Um, so sometimes that's the reason they're gone, and that always begs the question of if we want some of these species back in the landscape and we have restored the habitat, just like the, the gopher tortoises, we might actually have to consider putting them back there ourselves. Uh, I just want one other example. Here is a site down below that looks fairly nice in terms of the size of the trees, but it has tremendous erosional ditches that are filled in. And you can actually see that on LIDAR photograph. And I would, just, just like the Earth Explorer for aerial photos, I would say if managers have access to LIDAR images, it's an incredibly useful tool for helping look through the vegetation, look at the ground layer, and see where ditches are, where uh, different disturbances have occurred over the years, and help you figure out where you might need to fix a ditch, or plug something, or, or so on the landscape. So just uh, keep those in mind. I'd like to move on to isolated, um, the seasonal wetlands that we've talked about earlier, and look at um, specifically um, some examples of how we might manage the lands around seasonal wetlands. When um, I first came to graduate school here at Georgia, I had, I had left the position with the Nature Conservancy in Virginia. And I had been asked, uh, OK, here's we're, we're trying to protect seasonal wetlands. And how much land around the seasonal wetland do we actually need? And surprisingly, the answer isn't as easy as you might think, because the species that live in those seasonal wetlands where do they go when the wetland dries? Well, we found out a lot of interesting things. And I'm just going to show that this is the chicken turtle right here, a very interesting turtle in the southeast, one that is restricted to seasonal wetlands. It doesn't occur in permanent ponds. It doesn't occur in streams. It doesn't occur with large alligators. It doesn't occur with fish. So it is really a seasonal wetland dweller, just like a lot of our ambistomatid salamanders and our gopher frogs and all. And here's a range in the southeast, very much mimics the southeast coastal plain. So I actually had an opportunity to work with this species and on habitats on the Savannah River site in South Carolina as a graduate student. And what we would find is here's a seasonal wetland. The blue line is the actual delineated wetland boundaries. And many states, progressive areas, have 100 or 200 foot buffers around some of their wetlands that are designed basically to protect the wetland from adjacent runoff. Say if there's timbering or road construction or so adjacent wetland, those buffers were set up to protect wetland water quality. But they really do nothing to protect the diversity of animals that live in those wetlands, especially when you realize that when the wetland dries at 50 meters, 100, 150, and all the way out to 165 meters, that's where all these yellow dots are the chicken turtles when the wetland is dry. That's where they are. They're buried in the forest, in the soil layer, estivating. They do this for up to six or seven months, and they wait for the wetland to come back. Just for example, other turtles do it too. Eastern mud turtles, they're all the blue dots. They don't go quite as far, but they are there as well. The green dots on this are, are musk turtles. But you need to think about this amount of terrestrial habitat. It's not a buffer. It's the core habitat. It's as important to these animals as the wetland is itself. And so what does that mean for management of these type of isolated wetlands? In many cases, I think we have all seen a, a nice isolated wetland, unfortunately isolated by humans, in a center of a clear cut or in the center of an agricultural field. And certainly that doesn't help if there's animals that need to be buried in a forest canopy cover for half of the year. Uh, I'll show you an example right here. This uh, site right here is, a, is the same habitat all along. This middle picture actually shows when the bottom half of this site had been clear cut. And what's interesting is during that time, the turtles used the upper forest at half because they can't estivate out in the clear cut because in the middle of February in a clear cut, that ground temperature can get really hot on a sunny day. And they can't, they, their temperatures get too warm. They have to leave that spot. 
Likewise, it gets too cold. It's just not well enough buffered um, by temperature extremes uh, that a forest cover would have. So we look at something like the cover on the, on the far right, and we think, OK, that may be a very good habitat for uh, animals that require a forested buffer. Um, we do have to ask ourselves, what about in the case of turtles? They need open, sunny habitats to nest. And there are cases where, as in this picture here, it shows where the turtle nests actually are. And the turtles do find the open habitats, like this power line right away that runs up here. Or they find an old logging road along the back. And that's where you see all these turtle nests. So you need a little of both. But where did that open habitat appear when before human development of the landscape? Um, it's conjectural, but we believe a lot of these open areas probably were when big trees fell down in the landscape and they created forest gaps. That's where animals like turtles would have nested at that time. Those gaps change and appear and disappear from time to time. Now they use roads and they use power line right of ways and so on. But we need to keep that in mind. But we also need to realize that a lot of these species need a forested cover around these wetlands. Um, just for example, again, just to come back to the shifting baseline paradigm and the historic perspective, um, I might my that 1978 was the best time for turtles around this wetland. I know that in 1989, with this clear cut here, it was at least partial. So that would have been what I would call a compatible management right there, where this might have been the ideal management to use our two terms from the habitat management guidelines. You go back in the aerial photos and you see 1938, it was pretty well cleared, although maybe this forested area here was actually, which you can see is right here, provided the ref enough terrestrial refugia at the time so that this population didn't wink out or that the, the wetland was not unsuitable for chicken turtles and, and similar species. Um, besides thinking about wetlands and the terrestrial habitat around them specifically, also need to think about their place in the landscape. We need to think about corridors and connections. And for a wetland, like that exact same one we've been talking about, there's five other species of turtles that live there. Spotted turtles, which are state listed. Yellow-bellied sliders, which are very common. Snapping turtles, which are very common. Common musk turtles, which are common. And sliders, which are, I mean, I'm sorry, um, river uh, pond cooters, uh, pseudomies, which are also common. But when the wetland dries, they don't stay in the forest around it. They actually immigrate to the next nearest wetlands. Um, and usually for some of these larger aquatic turtles, it's the more permanent wetlands that they are moving to. Uh, and they have to have those corridors. Unfortunately, this is a two-lane road. A lot of sliders and a lot of cooters get killed on this road going between Dry Bay and Ellington Bay on this site. So keep that in mind in your management is the landscape perspective. While we're talking about wetlands, um, Mark talked about prescribed fire. And it is so great that we now have more emphasis on prescribed fire back into our land management. There was a long time where fire was excluded. Um, we do have winter burns. And I'm glad that we're at least doing winter burning. I would like to point out that in some cases, in evolutionary ecology, a lot of these amphibians migrate to ponds, seasonal ponds, in the fall to breed. That's when these wetlands fill. They fill in the winter, they maintain water, and then they dry out later in the earlier part of the summer. If we are lighting fires up in the middle of winter and we're burning through the wetlands, which we'd like to do, we may be burning up amphibians that are immigrating to the wetlands to breed because they're on a surface at that time. And they, we may be catching them vulnerable in their evolutionary history that's not a time that they had to worry about fire. They had to worry about fire in the summer, but that's when they're buried deep down in the ground when it's too hot and dry in the summer. But I would like to show, so keeping, that's one point. But I also would like to point out that we do want to burn wetlands. Wetlands actually need to burn. and But different months, when we burn them at different times of year, could make a real difference. On this column on the left is a wetland that we burned on the Savannah River site in uh, the winter time, but we burned it when this wetland, which was all panic grass, still had about several inches of water in it. So the fire came across, burned that all right down to the dirt layer or the water layer. But the next spring, that was just the grasses came right back, and it's not diverse. It's the same species coming back. 
However, if we burn a wetland over here on the right column, when the wetland basin is really dry and we get into those roots and we take out that woody vegetation and that monoculture of, re of, of um, panic grass, all of a sudden we see afterwards we have a diversity because there's a lot of diverse seeds down in that soil that are just waiting to get through. And because it hasn't been burned in so long, it was all just a monoculture of one species and woody button bush. So the time of year is really important. And also burning wetlands when they're actually dry and you can get the fire into the soil layer is really important. So I'd like to emphasize that, that growing season burns are really important and we shouldn't be keeping wetlands out of the burning cycle. All right, let's look at a permanent wetland. And this is actually one of our bog habitats. And since we're in the southeast uh, and these and this is a, a, a species in the center here, the bog turtle, which occurs in the Appalachian region. So it's of very important to the southeast. The bog turtle is, I would consider it a Pleistocene relic, as is this animal down in the corner, which is the American mastodon. Of course, that's extinct now. But in many cases, we have no way of proving this, but some of these open wetlands that look like this picture here with the sedge meadows, how would those habitats have been maintained open in the forested Appalachians of thousands of years ago? And it's probably because we had some big mammals that would come through there and occasionally just really turn them up and op expose them, knock down a tree canopy, and that's where you would have these open areas that species like bog turtles could exist. Well, today we need to make the habitat for them. They're declining because in many cases we've directly impacted habitat, such as ditching these and draining wetlands uh, right up here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, but we've had surrogates to mastodons. We've had cattle in a lot of these wetlands, like in the bottom picture, for a few centuries now in the Appalachians. And they have actually helped to maintain the open canopy. However, as a lot of these habitats, these farms disappear, uh, as family farms are de in decline, we find that there's invasive plants that were also introduced to those cattle, such as reed canary grass, that now takes over. And up in the left-hand corner, we find that reed canary grass has completely taken over this wetland. And we don't have the sedge clumps like we have in the far right here. We have this reed canary grass that is just kind of overgrown the sedges, taking out all the diversity of plants. However, there are places where we can actually work with herbicides. Glyphosate is one of them. Um, people know it as Roundup or Rodeo. Uh, and this is a herbicide that can be very helpful to us in dealing with some of these monocultures of invasive plants. I would be concerned of, I will say that glyphosate will also kill sedge, uh, tussock sedges. But we're going to actually do some experiments on a, on a, on a wetland uh, before too long here, we're going to put garbage can, plastic garbage cans upside down over the sedge tussocks before we spray the reed canary grass with glyphosate. We're just going to see what if we can't um, get the reed canary out, yet keep the sedges. Because if we just have a bare mud flat, it's going to be recolonized by reed canary, the invasive plant, before the sedges, which are a long-lived, slow-growing native species, get a hold in there. Uh, but you can also go through uh, this this um, researcher right here. He's got glyphosate right in that bottle, and he's going through one plant at a time, looking for purple loosestrife to cut and clip that out. Also, sometimes when we have invasion of these habitats, when the grazing is gone and the mastodons are gone, we have um, red maple forests that take over these wetlands, shade it out, and then the, it's no longer suitable for bog turtles. But girdling those stems, not cutting everything out, but just letting the trees die slowly and fall apart is a real good way of managing wetlands without making a big mess of downed trees. It just let them die slowly by girdling them, and it seems to work really well. I want to take us to one example of in the southeast here. Um, we have a lot of rivers that flow out into the Gulf of Mexico, and each one of them uh, from Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana has their own endemic species of map turtles. It's really incredible, the diversity of the genus Graptomys here in the southeast. One of the problems we have uh, is that they nest on nice white sandbars along these rivers. 
but we have changed river flow with our dams and we have tried to reduce the amount of winter flooding we would have. We've tried to keep water up higher in the summer for boating and recreational uses, but generally we've minimized the fluctuations in, in our rivers. When rivers flow really high water, they deposit these sandbars. These sandbars are critical for nesting habitat for these endemic map turtles and softshell turtles and river cooters. Um, then, because these sandbars have stabilized, we have both native uh, tree cover, such as uh, river birch. We have invasive plants, such as uh, tallow tree, uh, popcorn tree, uh, also known as popcorn tree, which have come into these sandbars. And then they shade out the nesting habitat. So there's opportunity to go in. This is a case we're using Garlon 4 on some of the river birch, just to go in there, hack and girdle these trees and we're getting some of the open habitat back on the and what we've gotten here the photo of a soft shell turtle coming up the nest these are with wildlife cameras this picture in the bottom center here has two ring map turtles which are a federally listed map turtle in the pearl river nesting and the photo on over here on the far right is another species of graptomies in a pearl river graptomies pearlensis which is one of the big headed map turtles uh, but we're seeing hatchlings and Part of doing, looking at the assessing how successful your management is, is are you getting the results you want? If you created nesting habitat, but you didn't go out and monitor to see if you're actually seeing hatchlings in the fall of each year in the river, well, maybe something's not happening the way you want it to. So monitoring your management action is important, just like inventorying your site before you start monitoring is also important. So hopefully um, that, that's helpful for, for everyone here. I want to just um, point out here in the southeast, um, there's only one species of reptile that lives in our brackish salt, salt marshes. Um, that's the diamondback terrapin. Uh, it is not federally listed, it is, but it does have various different state protections. It, it occurs all the way up to Cape Cod and all the way uh, in, the, in the northeast, and it goes all the way down to Padre Island in Texas in the west. So and you can see its range in the picture at the bottom. This species is really in trouble because it lives in salt marshes that li exist between the mainland and the barrier islands. And where do we all like to go in May and June? As to the barrier island beaches. And that's exactly the time of year that female ter diamondback terrapins are coming out to nest. And what they're coming out to do is look for high spots of well-drained sand that they can nest on. Um, they're not trying to distinctly cross the road. They're just looking for the dated part of the land in that sandbar. And that happens often, unfortunately, to be the dotted yellow line is the highest spot on the landscape. So what do we do about that? And there have been a number of researchers and conservationists who have tried to do things and are meeting with some success. Um, Putting up road signs, terrapin road crossing signs, can help letting the drivers know that terrapins may be coming, um, may be on the road. I would caution that leaving a terrapin sign up year-round means that people just get accustomed to seeing the sign. You really want the sign up only during May and June, during the nesting season, and the sign needs to go away the rest of the year. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone who's on a rush to get to the beach slows down for terrapins, but if you put speed bumps up, they might. Um, I'm in favor of putting up rubberized speed bumps across the road, something you could easily remove from time to time. That may require working with the public to ask them to accept that and to realize why you're trying to put speed bumps up there. I've, I have worked with a number of organizations that would immediately say, ah, we can't do that because the public won't accept that. Well. Maybe the public will accept it if we go to a public meeting and we explain why we care about terrapins and why we'd like to reduce the speed limit down so that people don't run them over. I think there's ways to do it. Um, I think there's also some other ways to do that. Uh, I just want to show an example right here is a piece of causeway on the Jekyll Island Causeway uh, from Brunswick, Georgia over to Jekyll Island. And a stream, a, a, a um, Tidal Creek goes through. This is all salt marsh habitat. This number 520 happens to be, if you look at this little dark line here, this 
area right here is a hot spot of diamondback terrapin road crossing activity. It's because they're, the female terrapins are using this, this creek crossing, then they come up and this is high ground here where these, this road and bridge cross the stream. And what we did is we built a combination nesting area and road barrier at that site. So a lot of folks have worked on putting up barriers to keep turtles from crossing the road. Um, and that's fine, except the turtle hits the barrier, is looking for a place to nest, walks the length of the barrier, and goes around the end and gets hit on a road. So what you need to do is give them a place to nest along that barrier so that they also, once they, they find that, they can't go out the back of this. They come up from the salt marsh. They're heading up to this high ground. They have a nice sandy area. They get inside this box and they can't go through it, they nest, they turn around and they go back to the salt marsh without ever having to come up on the road at all. One of the cool things about this box, if you notice really closely here, is we've actually electrified it as well. Turtles can get, it's just a tall enough so that the terrapins get underneath that, but when a raccoon tries to stick his nose under that, we have a 12 volt deep cycle marine battery hooked up here and he gets zapped, his nose, so he doesn't go under that box and get those nests. So we're not only protecting the females, which you know are long-lived species that need, are designed to live a long time um, and need to live a long time for stable populations to occur, but we're also trying to get some recruitment back into these habitats that have been impacted uh, by uh, our human activities by decreasing the number of adult terrapins in the population. Other reasons why terrapins have declined is by being caught in crab traps. Um, folks drum their tra traps and then they forget to check them often enough and terrapins get in them and they drown because they can't get to the surface. Or worse, people abandon a crab trap and then it becomes a ghost trap, killing terrapins for a long period of time until it finally rusts away. So it's, um, it's a problem. But uh, this is a really kind of a cool project that has worked. It's been both road barriers and nesting sites combined in a hot spot of terrapin activity and it seems to be working to keep terrapins off the road. I'd like to go to one other um, issue here. Sometimes we're trying to restore habitat and we unfortunately have to realize how much it is we've lost and what we're trying to save. This is um, what I'm looking at here is an aerial photo of a uh, Navy airfield. The photo is from 1955 from the Earth Explorer website. I want to show they were building a new runway at that time, but all of this dark gray area below is what you would call longleaf pine flatwood wet savanna habitat. And this is the habitat that uh, has been lost in so much of the southeast. It's the habitat of the flatwood salamander, both species, those fed, that federally listed species. And it's a habitat that was just very sensitive. We can drain it very easily and change it very easily. Um, this is an example of the habitat when of what you want it to be. Uh, this picture in 1955, I'm with my mouse. This area I'm circling right here is this exact spot right here. It's all wire grass. It's pitcher plants, and it's actually designed to burn as well. This part did not burn. This part we burned, and you can see how close the water is to the surface. This is true pine flatwoods habitat, and this is the habitat of the flatwood salamander. Uh, it's a beautiful habitat uh, botanically as well. You can see the uh, close of the pitcher plants here. Um, this is an area of that flatwoods habitat that would have ex stretched for, for miles um, in, um, uh, il along the Gulf Coast of Florida in the 1950s. Uh, you can see development occurring in the 1960s, a lot of housing going in in the 1970s, 1999, and the current, the exact same picture here, what's left of this landscape in 2005. So we only have a very small area to work with, but flatwood salamanders still exist there. But because when we got there in 2009, that little postage stamp remnant had been fire suppressed. That's what the open habitat now looks like with myrtle leaf holly as a shrub that is just taken over into that flat, low flatwood wet type habitat. Uh, but we tried something innovative, and this is with uh, partners with the, with the US Navy. And um, 
this has been really interesting. We decided we were going to try to clear and open one of these pond habitats. And what we did is we actually cut trees and took them out. So we did mechanical removal. We also used herbicide. This was Garlon 4 that we used. We tried two different methods. We actually hacked the um, trunks of these myrtle leaf hollies and just sprayed them in some spots. And it worked. It was a limited kill. It works. But if you don't go completely 360 degrees around the stem, you can see this part is still alive. Um, they die eventually, but it takes a while. What works really well is if you cut them and then you spray the stumps when the wetland is dry. Of course, you don't want to be doing this when the wetland has water in it. Uh, but boy, we are not getting any regrowth of this myrtle leaf holly. It's a lot of work to take all that out of there. But then in combination, we've also instituted some growing season burns. And we've put in fire breaks. And then we've actually burned the habitat. And I want to mention this is a June burn coming right into the grass bottom of that wetland, I do want to point out that flatwood salamanders, they breed in the fall, in October, and November, December, and they come from the forested habitat, or more forested savanna, to the depressional wetlands within the savanna, and they stage themselves in this grass edge. They wait for the water to fill the wetland and come and inundate to the edge, which is where they've left their eggs at the base of the grass. The wetland fills up, the eggs hatch, and if everything works the way it should, they, the larvae develop and then metamorphose the next spring and go back out into the forest savanna habitat. If we burn this habitat doing our traditional winter burns, we get right to the edge filled yet, and what do we do? We end up burning up that grass edge. That's the grass edge they need, but worse, that's where they are while, the, while we're burning. So it could be a real problem that we're, what we're doing to try to help the habitat, we're actually catching the population that we're trying to protect while it's on the surface. So that could be something we need to keep in mind. Again, I think where it's possible, the best, with the best fire management is burning at the time of year that fires would naturally occur. Um, however, let me just go back to the clearing of this wetland, and I just want to show a progression that's gone along here. From 2012, we had cleared a smaller area. Um, in 2000, uh, over here, we've cleared out more of it of, uh, in 2014, and now we're getting some grasses in the understory that we want. Keep your eye on this stump, because this is the same stump in each picture here, so it is the same uh, roughly the same view. Uh, last January, we actually had uh, sal uh, water in the pond again. We did not successfully dip net any flatwood salamander larvae, but we're hopeful that they're still in that landscape and it filled the wetland filled late in the season. So um, this is something that we don't always know if what we've done will be successful, but that's where continuing monitoring will be uh, important. And it also, I think, argues that for the point of trying new things for some of these species that we're down to very uh, limited distributions of or trying new things in terms of management. Um, and not everything will work, but sometimes maybe they will, like burning and, and uh, herbicide work here or the uh, nesting barriers and boxes for diamondback terrapins and just interesting ideas to start with, and I just throw these out so that people start thinking and being creative for other ideas. Um, I'd like to, I think at this point, I probably should, um, that's enough examples um, for today, but if people have questions, I would be more than happy to answer these, as would my, my co-authors, uh, Mark and Joe, as well. So I will um, thank you for your time and stop at that point. Okay. Thanks, Kurt. Um, lots of good information there as well. Um, we did have a question. I'm glad you stopped on this slide because there was a question about when is the um, Sea Park meeting. And so as you see here, it's February 16th through 19th. But if you'd like some more information on the meeting, um, please visit the Sea Park site, which is separc.org. And then um, you know there's a little meeting pull-down menu that you can grab there. But um, we have several questions. Um, let's see. Somebody wants to know how to control Japanese stilt grass with Roundup. 
and they said that there's been some early testing that suggests a very weak solution kills it without harming many other plants. I, I can take a try at that. This is Kurt. I have not used um, the glyphosate um, Roundup on um, Japanese stiltgrass specifically. Uh, we have used it on that canary grass uh, with the idea that we would, and, and it will knock it back. Um, that's a, a, a plant that I think we need to look at uh, more closely. It is a, a plant in the southeast. Uh, in the northeast that is is quite devastating in our northeast wetlands, uh, but I haven't had any experience with it here in the southeast. I don't know if any of the other authors would like to take a, take a hit at that. Don't have anything to add. This is Mark. Yeah, same here. Okay. Um, so then there was a question that says, um, as somebody who works for the National Park Service, and they said, my park has a major road that segments spotted and marbled salamanders from their breeding ponds. Um, and we have been working with Tom Mann and alternatives, and alternatives to mortality are limited. Do you have any recommendations to assist the animals, and is there, is there any um, evidence that shows that recreating pond habitats on the same side of the road um, would keep them from crossing. I, this does that is make sense? I can, uh, yeah, it does. Sure. I'd be good at that. Uh, I could give it, let me, let me address the, um, the road crossing issue first, perhaps, and uh, say that there have been a number of, of, of groups that have actually experimented with different types of uh, barrier, road barriers, and uh, under the road culverts. And I think if one went to the web, one would actually find folks in Ontario have done work with this with uh, some of the amphibians, some turtles, uh, Massachusetts, uh, all the way down to Payne uh, Preserve in Florida outside Gainesville. There is actually a concrete road barrier with a lip that actually tips backwards to away from the road. So snakes can't even get up on the road. They get up the barrier and they fall back onto the side. Um, as far as getting salamanders between their forested habitat and their breeding pond, uh, I think culverts under the road tend to be successful but those culverts can't be just a pipe that's buried. It would be an open graded top so that the regular moonlight, the rain, uh, sunlight, uh, not that they're moving during the day, but this are open. And the, perhaps the best way to work this is to work with the local Department of Transportation so that when the road is slated for some improvements or upgrade or new surfacing, that's when you work with the road department to say, hey, we need to put a culvert across between this hardwood upland and this wetland over here on this side. And it needs to be in conjunction with some kind of permanent barriers. Silt fence isn't going to do it because it's not going to last. But there could be some low concrete barriers that we have seen at Payne's Prairie or maybe some kind of, of aluminum flashing walls or so. Uh, there's ways to look into that. Maybe it's wood barriers um, that would funnel the animals to those crossings. Um, creating the ponds is a second issue. I, I would uh, direct the question, uh, the person to uh, Tom Biebighauser's book on wetland um, construction or restoration. There are a lot of examples of creating wetlands for amphibians, finding the exact, creating the recreating the exact pond that for spotted salamanders, for example, that is dry most of the year, that fills in January and dries again in, in June, will be difficult to mimic and put a pond where it doesn't exist. Um, it's better to protect the ponds that they are using because they have the characteristics they need. Um, not to say it's impossible, though. It can be something that um, we need to work on and get better at as conservation biologists. Um, any, any of you guys other, any other thoughts on that? 
Uh, this is Mark. Uh, one thing that, that's been done in some places, and it's it's sort of a stopgap uh, before the, the crossing infrastructure that you're talking about you know, can be put in place. But uh, I'm thinking about one example at uh, Sanford University uh, in Birmingham. They have a uh, spotted salamander crossing that has been known about for years now, and they have gotten a, a group of local volunteers to come out. You know, th these events can be predicted pretty well. Uh, when, it, when it's going to happen. And they'll go out there and they have flashing lights and I think they even have some police escort. And uh, it's fortunately not a heavily traveled road, so it's not like a, you know, it's, it's not creating a big problem for a lot of people. But it gets a lot of people involved, a lot of volunteers, a lot of you know, youngsters get exposed to this and it's, it's safe the way they do it with the uh, police officers you know, directing traffic. But that can be done for, you know, a period of years. I don't think it's something to recommend for, a, a, you know, a permanent solution. Okay, and the same um, person asking those questions was also interested in some recommendations for Webster salamanders as well because they also suffer road mortality. Is there anything um, different that you'd like to add that you haven't already said? Uh, Mark, again here, I, I know the Webster's uh, salamanders, I, I, I'm very aware of Tom's work on the Natchez Trace, and they, they crawl right up and over the fences, so you really can't fence them in very well. Uh, is, that, is that what you encountered, Kurt? I, I would agree, and they're a, it's a terrestrial salamander. They're not necessarily going to a, a pond on the other side. Uh, right. Where that would be a case where if the road... Um, were not needed in that area, that would be great because obviously we are bisecting their habitat with that road and, and they are just moving between suitable sections of their habitat that now exist on both sides of the road that we have cut in half. Yep. Okay, and um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that Delaware Water Gap actually closes roads whenever they have their um, annual amphibian migration and if you just google um, Delaware Water Gap you know road crossing for amphibians you'll you'll get get some articles that pop up about it but they actually close a five mile stretch of road um, five mile stretch of River Road in Monroe County um, Wow so yeah they do it from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and they do it um, just at varied times, but at any rate, more information is available on the internet. We don't have to go into all the exact details now. Um, and then somebody, you know, you kind of already answered this question, but somebody wanted to know if under highway passages work for movement of reptiles and amphibians. So sounds like you already touched on that. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add about reptiles, maybe? Do you feel like you covered it all? If, um, I think someone had a question about um, captive breeding and reintroductions for some amphibians, but I'm not... Um... Yes. Yep, there was a question about is there any capability to raise flatwood salamanders in captivity and reintroduce them into restored habitat? Did, um, Joe, right, do you want is, to start on that? Joe, yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a uh, project going on with the U.S. Forest, I'm sorry, U.S. US Geological Survey over in St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, where the biologists collected uh, the flatwood salamander larvae early in their development and uh, put them in cattle tanks and uh, allowed them to grow. That, that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, they grow up to metamorphosis, and then those animals were taken to a uh, facility that uh, keeps them for some some additional time and hopefully raise them up to adult status and the idea is to put them back. The problem has been keeping them alive at the, at the, uh, at the adult stage. So there's an ongoing project and it's, uh, so far it's not done a whole lot to help the salamander but they're trying. This is Kurt, if I could add to that. There, uh, it's sure. been very difficult to breed ambistomatid salamanders in captivity, but that has been 
accomplished by a few people now have been able to do it in, in zoo settings. I believe at the Riverbank Zoo in South Carolina has been done. So uh, with um, spotted salamanders or marble salamanders. So uh, it might be possible and it's just going to need some, some work and some people working hard on how do you get these animals to breed in captivity and likewise maybe putting um, larva back in the ponds or in new sites might also be an, a viable option uh, because then the larva will finish their development in a pond, go out in the terrestrial habitat and theoretically come back to that pond to breed. Um, so that might be something to think about. I believe that's been done with tiger salamanders in the southern New Jersey pine barrens years ago uh, successfully by putting eggs or larva in and now they do have adults breeding at that pond. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the final question is, do you see any increase of diamond back air pen collection at the nest box site that you construct that you constructed? It seems like it would be an attractant for pet collectors. Um, that has been um, thought of as a concern. Uh, we have been fortunate and not had any issues with collection. Um, when a diamondback terrapin female comes out to nest, she's actually pretty quick about her business. So she's nesting in about 20 minutes from the time she starts digging, deposits the eggs, covers them up, and leaves. So there's a really narrow window when she's actually in those nest boxes. If somebody were looking to collect terrapins, they're also crossing on the road at other areas. Uh, I would think our other only vulnerability would be, you know, if the eggs are there for a while and people, somebody wanted to try to get into those. Um, but we do have cameras up on the nesting boxes. It's there to was set up to monitor uh, raccoon uh, visitation and all, but uh, technically it's 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 monitored daily by by folks as well. So so hopefully everyone will respect that and be be uh, and we're doing okay with that. So okay. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. We don't have any more questions, and a special thanks goes out to Joe, Mark, and Kurt for your time and expertise that you've provided with everybody. And like we said, we will have a resources sheet that has their email information so that you can contact them if you have further questions. It will also have um, a list of various resources, including the Reed Noss book that um, Mark mentioned earlier. So um, thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you.